Um, a well articulated presentation, very impressive. Um, and in terms of uh, him bringing to memory a lot of his experiences from the tip of his uh, tongue, uh, very easily recorded. And some, a lot of the things, uh, or a lot of us who lived it, because these are economic issues that we have through every day. So. Uh, a lot of what he says uh, makes sense. He's adding up the figures for us and it now makes sense what was happening and the decisions that were being made. Uh, but I do have a, a few questions, maybe comments as well uh, from what he has been sharing with us. Uh, for example, for me, it boggles the mind after telling us what he has told us, the relationship with uh, his counterparts and of the corruption that is there in government that has since, since worsened. Um, why uh, anyone that is a brilliant lawyer in the opposition would defend any ZANU PF member that is accused of corruption? Maybe today he would be able to help us understand that because that is a question I have had that many people have had um, that. As opposition lawyers, uh, you you tell us about all these things that you witnessed. You as finance minister first and uh, seeing these things um, happening uh, under your watch, seeing people steal money, uh, taxpayers' money being diverted for personal use, and when the opportunity comes to hold these people accountable. Or I know there were, the argument has been that everyone has a right to a fair trial, everyone is innocent till proven guilty, and that justice is blind. But is there no case to answer in, in the sense that we could kill two birds with one stone here? Because we have you as opposition members knowing what is exactly happening and having the prosecutors. Of course, the, a lot of these cases are politically uh, motivated. They are meant to settle uh, a, a factional and political scores. But these uh, prosecutors that will be going after their own party know where the bodies are buried. Or let me say in this case, they know where the money is buried. Why not allow them to be caught and at least lessen the burden for uh, the taxpayer? Uh, maybe also I'd love to understand from the former minister, how did it feel for you individually and maybe as the MTC at the time, handing back an economy that you had found in tatters, in tatters cashed up, even repaired, uh, almost to glory, uh, handing it back to Zanu PF to do with as they wished. Did you in any way feel you'd been naive? Uh, had you been too trusting of your GMU partners, looking back, in that there was a sense that um, from what you say, you started, you hit the ground running, in essence, on the 16th of February, you started working from day one. But was everyone else doing the same? Were your colleagues working or a lot of them were just enjoying the perks? Uh, were they holding these people to account? Were they trying to ensure that the policies would be in place to make sure that the opposition at least had a fighting chance come 2013? When we even look at some of the clauses in the new constitution that we eventually uh, gave into as the public, when we look back now, we feel like we shouldn't have agreed to some of those things that are now coming back to bite us and some of them are even being uh, pushed upon us to amend. Um, when you look back, do you feel like uh, other members uh, of your party uh, played as, as good a role in terms of working hard um, within the GNU? And, and maybe finally, uh, you introduced something in government that I thought was brilliant, but it also maybe in the back end became um, a window into how uh, opposition uh, members would perform if they were given uh, access to resources, the Community Development Fund, because that's where we saw some of those people that we hoped would be um, you know, crispy clean if they were to come into government, show sure, their true colors in terms of handling resources. Do you think that um, the CDF became uh, like a um, sort of like a, a reflection of what some members of your party then uh, were going to behave like if they were to be given full control of the economy? Um, 
and then uh, what loopholes do you think uh, would be would need to be filled for it to be successful? Because I realize that that blueprint is now being taken over, even for things like devolution fund. That uh, that is uh, is called that um, your 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 idea continues to be used now, um, and uh, there is a lot of questions as to how those funds are being used for the benefit of communities. So, what would you say about that, um, Mr. Beatty, in terms of um, how we have a feel of how both sides uh, somehow behave in terms of using our, our public resources? I think I'll end them about go. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Busi. Um, tonight, do you want to pick on um, the questions? Uh, maybe if we start with the first one around uh, defending, uh, what was what was it? Was it because uh, you you did ask a couple defending? Is it Zanu? Well, I was saying as opposition lawyers himself, I think Jobs Kala, Welshman Mube, um, and I think at the time uh, Lab Mumaduku defended some members of Zanu PF against corruption cases. I think even current uh, president of CCC. Uh, advocate Chami that did defend as an APF member on a case that involved corruption. So my question is how uh, as opposition members or as you are saying now how corrupt ZANU PF is, both as politicians in, in ZANU PF and as government ministers were, but you are still able to stand up for them in court and defend them despite the gruesome uh, thieving that they were doing uh, to the detriment of our national uh, fiscus. Okay. Um, Tendai, I don't know if you managed to pick that one up. Would you be able to answer that one? Tendai, can you hear me? Wow. Apologies, guys. It's, I know it's, Kuluma, his mic is in. Uh, maybe he is uh, failing to to be heard. He may need to leave and come back. Uh, I'm wondering if that could be a solution. Yes, we'll park a question for now, sis, we'll see, and hopefully um, pick it up when he returns. Mpiwa, are you with us at the moment? Um, yes, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm here. So I, I hope that Tenda is able to to hear at least. So I also have, I want to say thank you very much for that um, presentation. Very insightful, the journey you took us through, getting to know how you ended up, where you are, how you ended up in the mini, being the Minister of Finance with a legal background. You know, they always tease us that lawyers and figures, we are yeah. not friends. But uh, you were able to end up there and you were able to, to, to hold your own. Even you highlighted some of the improvements that were made and, and not just uh, cosmetic improvements like we hear when they say there's an excess and yet the ordinary citizen is struggling. At that time, you could see that even the ordinary citizen's life, there was some form of uh, improvements and adjustments. So... Thank you for taking us through that and also really painting the picture in terms of some of the real challenges that the country is facing, that the country faced even then at that time. I mean, you really delved deep into the levels of corruption and state capture and so much that is going on with command agriculture. I was even reminded of the uh, is it, uh, farm mechanization scheme that also happened around about that time and how the citizen has been made to bear the brunt of, of, of that debt and to carry that debt through. So that was really, and, and also some of the, ex, the, 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 the recovery uh, mechanisms. What I liked was that you addressed the issue of the bread and butter, that before we talk about the bullet trains and everything, which is critical because yes, the world is moving forward. If you really move 
around Africa, you'll be surprised at the level of uh, movement and development. And if you look at where we were in Zimbabwe around 2000, you see that had we not regressed, we would have been way ahead. But I think I like that you address the issue of the social contract, the issue of our 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 wounduness as Zimbabweans, which is really broken. When you go into the streets, you see that there is a lot of brokenness. As Zimbabweans, we are not even able to disagree respectfully and amicably. It's almost like you can't go every time it's going for the person instead of going for the issue or the fact we we have become so divided, we have become so negative, and in rebuilding, there is there will really be there will really the need for concerted efforts to ensure that we are dealing and healing even on that front we need to heal as a nation we need to find each other we need to to learn to get back that ubuntu which will help us to corrupt co collaborate and re economy so for me what i really wanted to understand maybe is that um you did mention the really the challenges around corruption and all in in everything. So, and I remember seeing the last Auditor General's report, which made reference to a myriad of institutional challenges in our financial system in the country. It even spoke of how tenders are awarded, tenders are monies are just paid. There is no follow up in terms of delivery of that work. You, there is money is just bleeding in the system and. Was that the same thing that you experienced during your tenure as, as, as the finance minister? And how do you think, really, if we, are, if we are going to build our economy effectively, what are some of those institutional, uh, financial institutional challenges that are there that we need to really curb in terms of, 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 of taking ourselves uh, forward? And also, I was just really interested to know that, do you think there is a way in which... Uh, we could ever be able to hold those that have captured the state, those that have bled the state dry, accountable, and maybe get back some of the monies and some of the resources that have been uh, that have been lost. You spoke about the the diamond uh, industry and the monies that were lost that we do not even know what happened to them. Is there ever a chance that we could ever? Um, get retrieved those and then i also just wanted to ask to say um how can you in your opinion how do you think we can tap into the diaspora um, resource or diaspora power in order to build our economy so many times when we are talking about rebuilding the economy we are always focusing on uh uh foreign investment foreign investment but we know that we have a significant chunk of our people who are outside of zimbabwe and who've contributed so much in terms of uh, uh um uh, foreign currency remissions and all that, how can that really be tapped into and made into a solid, useful resource that can help us uh, rebuild and revive uh, the economy? And also, what I just wanted to also ask maybe towards the final is that, um, so in 2017, um, what was the end game for the opposition when they supported the move to impeach Robert Mugabe and the cool not so cool what was the strategy behind what were you what was opposition envisaging, envisaging or hoping to achieve out of that uh, process i will pause here for now thank you very much Pio, uh, those so, questions you wanted to come it. in now um, and um, tendai can you hear me hello um, Mzala, can you um, ask him if he can he, hear you? Yeah, we, we can hear you. Yeah, you can come through, sir. All right, so I'll, I'll be very quick here. So the last question on, uh, on, on 2017, I think it's actually a new, a new era. And I think that um, a lot of people, a lot of people uh, thought that that coup would be the end all in the B, 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 BO, which was, which was wrong. <coughs> uh, which was wrong, and we've all learned our our, our 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 lessons. I gave a I gave a, a speech which is uh, available on YouTube uh, in Johannesburg uh, on, uh, uh, on 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 Wednesday, the twenty first of uh, I think it was Thursday, the twenty second, the twenty second of uh, 
the 22nd of November 2017, inauguration was on Friday the 23rd, in which I, I warned and I said, look, Zimbabweans are expecting not just a new leaders, but but new leadership, a new value a system. And I, the word I used was a new uh, social uh, a contract. And it, those who are going to take over, if they think we'll settle for less, they are mistaken. The Zimbabwean crisis uh, will not uh, uh, go away. So I, I said a lot of things uh, th that day about uh, what Zimbabweans were expecting. And unfortunately, it has not been uh, heeded. But I think we've learned our lessons, uh, you know, you know, right now. Our country needs fundamental structural change. Our country needs transformation. We have been abused by power. We've been abused by 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 people that don't value lives. You know, I was I was so shaken and shocked. Uh, by the story, the recent story of this Mbirenyana guy uh, who was he being hit in this country, uh, this genocide there from uh, from Rwanda, this this Hutu uh, general. Given what is going in in this country uh, with with Gugura Wundi, uh, we have a problem. Uh, we have a we have a big 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 problem. So so yes, the mood was there, uh, and and we have learned from the from that mood. And uh, hopefully, I hope every Zimbabwean understands that uh, undemocratic means of attaining change can never create a democratic outcome. The two are self-mutually exclusive and self-destructive. They can't work and they won't uh, work. Uh, and that's the biggest lesson of 2017. Undemocratic means of attaining democratic change can never achieve democratic outcomes, let alone democratic change. And that's the biggest outcome of 2017. The, di the diaspora is so key, uh, my sister. Zimbabwe is receiving a billion US dollars worth of remittances in the last two years. That's much, much more than the 200 million US dollars which we are receiving in respect of uh, uh, foreign direct investment. It's more than the around 600 million US dollars we are receiving in the form of uh, overseas development assistance. So diaspora remittances have become the biggest form of capital accumulation uh, in Zimbabwe. They contribute the biggest chunk of Zimbabwe's capital account. So, so there must be a quid pro quo. Uh, there the can be a representation uh, they can be taxation without the representation. So people in the diaspora who are in fact paying a great tax, when you send a flower to your grandmother in Makokoa, you are paying a tax because the state has failed, the state has retreated. So you have to send medicine uh, 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 for, 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 for your blood pressure, for your diabetics. You are, you are in fact uh, paying a tax which economists call a great tax. And one of the reasons why we had the industrial uh, 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 revolt, the industrial revolution, the French Revolution, uh, uh, was because of uh, uh, taxation without representation. So the, the, there must be a diaspora vote. But I think the diaspora cannot only be seen in an instrumentalist way where we are extracting a, a, a income from them. I think they've got a much bigger role to play an intellectual role, and I think that you will save Zimbabwe ultimately because we are here, we are exhausted, we are in fights, we don't have electricity, we are worn down by the day-to-day -day challenges of just trying to reproduce yourself, waking up one morning, going to your house, do you have cooking fat, is it available in the shops, etc. So you represent a very a fresh uh, population that has been exposed to uh, standards in uh, functional estates, so your time will come uh, because we need all hands on 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 deck. The diaspora is the future. The diaspora is a uh, uh, is a uh, imp important. Uh, then uh, your first uh, your first two questions. You, you spoke about uh, accountability. Will we ever recover these things? And, and what needs to be done? 
so so that's a critical question. You see, part of the part of the challenge with the uh, the UN system is that they've been good on coming up uh, with a political uh, human rights uh, uh, instruments. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights the Universal Declaration of Human Rights itself. But they've been slow to come up with instruments and conventions that deal with, number one, issues around money laundering, issues around illicit financial flows, uh, issues around uh, exploitation of, of Africa and African resources. Uh, so one of the things that uh, we suffer is that Africans, sub-Saharan Africa, we have lost billions of dollars, but where is our money? Our money is in the West. Our money is in Swiss uh, uh, bank accounts. So we need the help, UN to come up with a system, a, an international convention that uh, forces repatriation of ill-begotten gains uh, to victim countries. As I'm talking to you right now, there are literally billions of dollars in Mauritius of Zimbabwean money. And if you take away Zimbabwean money right now in Mauritius, Mauritius uh, will kill it. That we, 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 we will take. There are two, three banks in Mauritius, and I won't mention their name, that are that have become a cesspool of money laundering from from from, from Zimbabwe. And some of the big uh, cronies, uh, some of the humongous uh, uh, cronies and cartels that I always refer to as uh, Gananda. They've got their monies uh, in uh, Mauritius. But so too Singapore, uh, so too Dubai. In Dubai, Dubai has become a playground of Zimbabwe's rich. They're buying apartments there, two million US dollars and, 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 and so forth. Uh, and, and they love to spend money. The conspicuous consumption is just shocking. Uh, someone who lives in Borodo Brook will wake up at 3 a.m. and drive a Lamborghini make noise to residents. The conspicuous consumption is loud and it's primitive. And that's what happens when accumulation becomes accumulation uh, for the sake uh, of, of, of accumulation. It's, it's ugly, it's odious, and, and it, it must stop. So Zimbabwe will recover its money, but not uh, all of it. Uh, Abacha, they recovered 7 billion US dollars, but they reckon it's a fraction uh, of the money that he siphoned out. Mobutu Seko, they reckon it's a fraction uh, of the money he siphoned out. But sometimes, you know, you, you, sometimes don't waste a lot of time concentrating in the past. Move forward. Uh, rebuild your economy. Build institutions, strong institutions. One of the things that makes me cry about Zimbabwe and, and everywhere where there is failure in Africa is how state capture attacks the judiciary. And without the judiciary, we are lost. Because the judiciary is a, is a guardian, the judiciary is a referee, the judiciary is an umpire, and if the umpire itself uh, becomes a gate crasher, if the gatekeeper becomes a gate crasher, uh, we have a problem. So we have a duty and an obligation to rebuild these institutions, particularly our Chapter Twelve institutions: the judiciary, the anti-corruption commission, the human rights commission, the national prosecuting authorities, and so forth. But it will take time. <laughs> It will, it will take time. Uh, so accountability is important, uh, but but we require a change in the mindset. And from where I'm sitting, what we have lost uh, uh, tremendously uh, is, is, is a mindset. I, I see a very polarized uh, Zimbabwe. I see that the liberation movement is exhausted, but the liberation movement he has created toxicity and intolerance. Leaders of the liberation movement are not leaders of Zimbabwe, but president of Zimbabwe, president political party. They are president of a faction of the ruling uh, a, a, a party. And, and where you have liberation movement, and Mzala, you are the historian, if you look at uh, liberation movements, that participated in wars, liberation wars that took a long time. Uh, and I make reference to, 
to Frelimo in, 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 in Mozambique, I make reference to the MPLA in Angola. These liberation movements have got so many things in common. And, 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 and there are three that I want to highlight. The first one is the culture uh, of entitlement. We can get anything we want because we liberated you. Uh, we can get farms. Uh, right now, they're going through another process of, of verif 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 verification so that they can they can loot and, and, and so forth. We want land. We deserve a, a, a special allocation of, of stands and so forth. Uh, they're the, they're the first on the queue when Operation Maguta, Operation uh, 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 Commander Agriculture comes and, and so forth. So the culture entitlement of entitlement is, is killing us. The culture of impunity is, is killing us. They get away with everything. They get away with anything because they liberated uh, uh, us. Then finally is this uh, zero-sum mindset, a winner-take-all mentality, a scorched earth mentality. No one should govern this country unless you've got the page of the liberation struggle. Remember the statement that uh, Jinagashi made in 2001, on the eve of the uh, March 11 uh, election, when he said uh, the it's a straight jacket, only a person who fought in the liberation struggle uh, should govern this country. And and and, and I'm afraid uh, there are many who believe in that uh, in that uh, in that uh, you know you know you know you know you know you know philosophy. So so we've got a, a long way to go, uh, which is why I said. Uh, 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 that the biggest challenge we'll face is not uh, uh, the mechanical uh, things that we can deal with. You know, you can you can achieve a GDP growth rate. It's quantifiable. It's empirical. It's the non-empirical stuff that Zimbabwe will, will grapple with. The, the value system, U Ubuntu, our African world. If you look at the levels of intolerance here on Twitter, the levels of intolerance the levels of toxicity. The, some of the language, uh, uh, you know, if you start the Rwanda, the language that is used is very close to Rwanda in April 1994. It's the language of genocide. And when they use language, they must dehumanize you. In Rwanda, they to call the Tutsis cockroaches in order to justify a crushing, uh, you, know, you, know, you know, the cockroaches. We use the same language in Zimbabwe. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and because, because uh, uh, you know, there has to be a delegitimization. So I see a lot of people without uh, conscience, uh, what, what T.S. Eliot calls the hollow men, men without eyes in their conscience. And, and that is the problem. Uh, and I say men deliberately because most of them are men. They wear trousers, uh, long, ugly trousers. And so that is the problem with, uh, uh, with Zimbabwe. And I hope that we can change this. I hope that... Uh, and I'm worried about the youth. Sixty-nine percent of the population is, is 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 are young people. They have no jobs. They've been hit by fatalism. A, a pastor will fill a stadium. Sixty thousand people can go to the national sports stadium, uh, where you are told that uh, if you buy this anointed cloth, you can go and rob a car, any car you want, and you. That's fatalism. Uh, that's fatalism, and our people are flocking to those churches. Our people are flocking to 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 to, to wish doctors. Uh, 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 young women are being told do this to get to get married. People have forgotten that there's something called education and the dignity of education, and that that education is the only sangoma in the world that is worth talking about. That education is the only passport you need. That education is the only spectacles you need. Uh, but that, unfortunately, uh, has been undermined. And how can it not be undermined when graduates uh, are selling tomatoes in, the, in, in airtime and graduates are waiters uh, in Santon and in Cape Town? So this is what we need to salvage. This is what we need to, to salvage, which is why I said at the beginning, the political question is a, is a, is a, is a precondition uh, to Zimbabwe moving forward. Uh, I will stop here. Okay, th thank you so much uh, for those uh, responses. Uh, let's take the questions that were raised by uh, Bosi about opposition lawyers representing uh, ZANU-PF politicians accused of 
a corruption. What's your response to that? She says it's not good optics for you uh, to be representing ZANU-PF politicians accused of corruption. Uh, well, look, you know, I agree that the optics are not uh, good. Uh, I agree that uh, in an ideal environment, uh, that should not happen. But I also, I also know, and I speak for, uh, I speak for myself. I've, I've represented, uh, I've represented, uh, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, characters where, where no, no lawyer in Zimbabwe would touch that person. And my first experience was actually with the Dabaning story uh, many years ago when I was a young lawyer. You know, Dabaning story was charged with treason. And I was a young lawyer with uh, five years' experience. No lawyer in Zimbabwe was prepared to touch him because they were afraid of ZANU PF. Uh, you know, and then I ended up doing this big treason case uh, when I was very young. And some few years ago, I faced the same uh, thing. No, no lawyer could touch this particular client. So sometimes, you know, you say to yourself, we took an oath. It's just like doctors. Doctors take an oath, the Hippocratic oath to save life. But there is no doc even the doctor will be disbarred if uh, you are in, for lack of a better example, you are a triple C doctor or one aligned to the democratic change and you say, I can't treat this doctor, they will disbarred you. So sometimes lawyers themselves find themselves in that situation. And I'm speaking of myself because I've found myself in that uh, situation. But I agree with the criticism. Uh, I agree that the optics uh, uh, don't sound right, and which is why you've never heard me defend anyone. But I just want you to let you know that subjectively, uh, some things happen which, uh, which uh, you can't explain. You probably explain in memoirs. Uh, because to the outside world, they don't make, uh, uh, they don't make sense. And I've been in that uh, situation. I've given the example of the banning story in 95, no lawyer. And the iron of the banning story that he, he had actually been paying a retainer uh, to one of Zimbabwe's biggest uh, law firms. But when push comes to shove, they couldn't touch him. Round about the same time I represented Margaret Dogo, you remember, in San Indo, when she, Zanupiev cheated her out. And no lawyer again in, in, in Zimbabwe could touch him. And uh, Maduku, uh, Maduku, when he was still part of us, came to me and said, Tendai, you are the only one who can do it. And I said, Maduku, <laughs> but you are also a lawyer. And even he didn't want to do it. So there are stories, there are always stories behind stories, speaking for myself, but I agree entirely that the optics doesn't sound good. But sometimes there are things that that one can't stand out and explain. Uh, one can sort of... Sort of, sort of, sort of there, are, there are also relatives. I know one or two cases where uh, the client is Zanupif, the lawyer, it belongs to our movement, but they're actually relatives, but he can, that person can come out and say, but this is actually my uncle, he paid my school fees and so forth. So in other words, they, sometimes there are stories uh, which we can't come out uh, and, and, and defend, but I agree absolutely that the optics are not good. Oh, okay, we have this question, it says uh, from Sizani Weza, it says has BT looked at Zambia in the last six months? What have they done right? Their currency appears to be gaining value. Well, I think they've opened up. They've opened up. Let me tell you a secret about the economy, Mzala. The, the economy is like a river, a giant river, the Zambezi River, uh, going to the Indian Ocean. The Limpopo going south, ending up in the Indian Ocean. So when you are a government or a, or a minister of finance, your role is to make sure that the, this giant river actually goes to the to the ocean. So so remove controls. But your role now is clerical. Your role is to make sure that this giant river allows Mr. Duwe, uh, Mr. Sbanda, uh, Mr. Chigodora to water his little garden there. So so you are like a clerk. You are like a clerk. If you interfere with this giant river, it will hit you. Uh, Adam Smith used to call it the invisible end uh, of, of, of capital. So what our friend HH has done is just to open up because business people are good at creating wealth. But business people are terrible at distributing wealth. Capital is terrible at, at distributing wealth. Capital is terrible at rewarding its workers. That's where the redistributive state uh, comes in. 
uh, what what development our economies call Bonapartism. You're like Napoleon Bonaparte. So your duty is to oversee and ensure that there is fairness uh, in the economy and that this huge river is carrying everyone, not just watering uh, Mr. Mpofu's garden, literally and metaphorically. That's the role, and that's what HH is doing. But there are things that I, I know which are happening there, and I can tell you that reform is difficult. People, when people get used to certain things, to stealing, to shortcuts, they move slowly. And, and it's the untold story of Zambia that sometimes the bureaucracy doesn't want to move. Sometimes insiders, the apparitic, actually uh, will sabotage you because they are used to looting, they are used to, to certain things. And when you come and impose change, they look at you and say, but whom do you think you are? And in the middle of the night, they, they undermine you. So reform is difficult. Reform is requires toughness, which is why, uh, which is why, uh, if you look at, uh, in, in particular, in Southeast Asia, the examples of progress have actually been a, a progress done by hard men. Uh, uh, Suharto was a hard man. Uh, 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 Chairman Deng in China was a, was a hard man. Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore was a hard man, which is why some cynics and critics of democracy will argue that what Africa and poor states need is not democracy, but hard men, because hard men uh, move forward. I, 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 I dispute that contention. Uh, democracy is, is necessary. But the point I'm simply making is that uh, uh, difficult decisions have to be made. And not many are, are, are equal to the task of making the hard decisions uh, that is required to be made. And remember, the election cycle is so small. It's five years. So so you begin to think, the minute you win this election, you begin to think about winning the next election. And so populism comes in. And one, once populism comes in, you've got a danger now of not making the right decisions. The biggest word that I ever used when I was Minister of Finance was a no. So I would say no even before you've opened out your, your mouth. And then I was like, oh, you were, what were you trying to say? Oh, I see. So no must be your number one weight. But no is not possible in an, in an era where the next election is around the, the corner. I did it and got away with it, but I was not the prime minister. I was not the, I was not the president. So, so tough decisions must be made. Uh, Zambia is doing well, but there's a lot that needs to be, to be done. And the system is slow. The system is against the uh, change. Uh, and 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 we and uh, and uh, and oh, this is okay. So thank you so much uh, for these responses. Emma Poko, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Um... Yes, you can take in our listeners to 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 come through and raise their issues, questions, or comments. Uh, based on what uh, Honorable BT has been uh, uh, presenting to us. No worries. Um, so uh, before I do that, can I just check if Tendai can hear me now? Uh, I can he hear you. Hear I can hear you. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so just a few um, <laughs> rules, guys. Uh, before I extend the mic to those that have requested, we've had a few requests. So I'm going to try and go line by line, pretty much uh, first come, first serve uh, type of situation. Let's try and keep it respectful. Tendai Mzala, is our can guest. can we break it in, uh, Yes, yes, we should be yeah. done by then. We should have been yeah. done by nine o'clock, but people are enjoying, are enjoying your presentation. <laughs> they don't want you to go. dictator. <laughs> I've got a dictator who is looking at me. <laughs> no, by 10 it will be done. People yeah. are enjoying this rally. Uh, <laughs> dictator is looking at me. Okay. okay so, so Mapoko, go through the questions. Let's quickly round up then. No worries, guys. As you've heard, we've only got a short time. So please keep your questions short and make it just one question. Uh, Mashona, if you can come in, please. Mashona, if you can ask your question. Um... Uh, th 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 thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll be very, very quick. Uh, Honorable Miti, uh, 
thank you so much for coming here and I'm not going to take much of your time but uh, I want to thank you for acknowledging the government of Zimbabwe on what they are doing in terms of energy and also uh, on uh, you know improving the livelihoods of Zimbabweans but my question to you Mr Bit is that uh, when you were the minister of finance there were so many banks closed under your watch I'll give you an example Renaissance Bank Royal Bank Century Bank ETC what was happening in the in, in the banking sector during your time and my last question to you Mr Bit is that you are refusing to acknowledge that you were representing Tendai Bit uh, you were representing Gijon Gono who, whom you, you used to call an archbishop of corruption through mechanization and and other things thank you so much uh, host and co-host. i appreciate thank you uh Tindai, would you like to answer those two questions yes i think i answered on the legal issue i think i answered i don't think I, i'm sure you didn't uh, uh, you didn't get uh, uh, you didn't get uh, you didn't get me on that one i answered on the legal on, on, on the, the legal, legal issue case. and yeah, uh, what about the the banks um, oh yes, 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 yes. Yeah. So the problem that happened was that uh, a lot of these banks were undercapitalized. You, you understand? So they didn't have capital. You know, you you, you need uh, twenty five million US dollars to start a bank. So if you, you if you mention the Royal, there were very small banks. Uh, Publican owned by Mutuli, there were tiny banks. So they were closed not by the Minister of Finance. We don't have those powers, but they were closed by the regulator. Uh, the reserve bank time bank and so forth and uh, and uh, so so it was basically a question of uh, people starting banks when they didn't have a, 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 a money and so that's why they were shut down by the uh, by the regulator of course some of them some of them had money but they they overextended themselves they overextended themselves so it was not the minister of finance it was the regulator uh, the reserve bank and that's what it should be. The regulator must play his part. The only problem I had, I have, and I had, you had me say this in Parliament, I don't think the regulator should also play the role of registering banks. So the, the, the Reserve Bank should not register banks. They should just regulate. They should be a separate register of, of banks. Thank you, Tendai. Um, Kurundai, if you can uh, unmute and ask one question, please. Kurundai. Okay, we'll move on to Tandazani. If you can unmute, please. Okay, thank you very much, host, co-host, and uh, greetings to the Deputy President there. Uh, Mr. Deputy President, I've got uh, only one question that I want to ask you. Uh, I, I listened through your presentation, and you didn't mention the sanctions there. I want you to, to, to take me through. Tell me the effects of sanctions in this whole juncture of the I, 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 I dealt with sanctions. Uh, sanctions. Maboko, you asked me about Maboko, sanctions. I've dealt with sanctions. I've dealt with. No, I think I wasn't in the house. Then I have Yeah, to so just play the tape. Just play the recording. But I dealt with okay, that. Okay, then I let me ask the another question, okay? You spoke about the issue of the polarization, and uh, you were spotted in one of your rallies uh, saying the people should stop listening to ZANPF music and this and that. Don't you think what? that is ZANPF also... What? You said you called it ZANPF Mchongororo, actually. So can you tell me could, um, that is not promoting polarization within your members, because this person is saying for ZANPF, therefore, our Mchongororo, and you are against polarization, you are saying Zimbabwe should be at least healed from polarization from this uh, disease. Are you not one of the people that are promoting? Uh, no, if you if you listen to my rallies, if you listen to my rallies, and, and uh, by the way, we were recording them, uh, but the rallies in the, in the, in the by-election, I don't promote hate speech. I don't promote uh, tribalism. I don't promote any ism. But the thing that I will criticize from from morning to evening uh, 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 kulaks uh, 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 criminals are uh, cartels so there are certain names you hear me repeat over and over again you hear me say talk about Kudata Gbire, Bill Rottenberg John Bredenkamp uh, Nicholas Van Vustrostrat I, I can't pronounce his name 
uh, Radish Hamish, uh, Macmillions, and so forth. Those I will talk about. But you, beyond those, you will not hear me utter any words. I, I, I am a student of history. I, 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 I lived in this country during, uh, 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 you know, Kukura Wundi. One of my closest friends, Ken Nube, a lawyer at three Gs, escaped death by a whisker. His bus was stopped uh, when they were going to, 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 to Bulawayo from, from Gweru. And, and uh, he was asked to say some difficult shown expression. He couldn't. He was only saved because he managed to produce a university ID card. We used to go to the University of Zimbabwe and in each class you know that certain students would not come back because of Gukura Wundi. I've studied the Rwanda. I've been to the genocide memorial in Rwanda. So I will never promote a hate speech, which is why consistently in my life as a as a lawyer, I've represented the marginalized women, trade unions. I, I, I've been to, 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 to Chilonga, you know, amongst the Shengwe Langani uh, people, and it's one of the proudest cases uh, that I've ever done. So, so, so I will not promote hate speech, and I've not promoted hate speech, but don't confuse my attack on cartels as an attack on, uh, as a, as, as a as sowing the seeds of a division. It's not uh, cartels are costing our people. Corruption is a tax on our people. And when you see poor neighborhoods, 95% of our people are unemployed. 79% of our people are living in extreme poverty, surviving on less than US $1.25 a, 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 a day. So corruption is costing our, our people. Look at the state of our roads. Look at the state of our schools. Uh, one Zubko bus boat can build three schools uh, in 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 Kaudri Park in Dubalazimu, in in Binga. So so no to corruption, no to hate speech, no to tribalism, uh, no to 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 toxicity. And we are tired of toxicity. Thank you, Tandai. Um, I will move on to Wellington. Um, if you can unmute and ask your question, please. Thank you, host and co-host Mark Boko and Mzala Tom. Honorable BT, I was impressed with your submissions, given you're a lawyer and not an economist. Uh, perhaps you live in with my confidence as future finance minister. My question directly is to fixing the currency. Given that fixing this currency right now would destabilize I ZANU-PF, particularly... I can't hear. Particularly... I, uh, am I audible? Sorry, Tendai. Yes, I can hear you, Ellington. Okay, you might need to relay this. Uh, given that uh, fixing the currency situation right now towards 2023 would destabilize ZANU-PF because I'm with you that the existence of the black market or indeed inflation is a direct result of uh, printing money and quasi central bank uh, activities in the financial sector are you predicting that we should be ready for a ride towards 2023 of deeper economic collapse or specifically the cronies i suspect are too big to fail just like the world economic recession when enron couldn't be a, when it was allowed to fail if we allow the current uh, crony monopoly in the financial sector to collapse wouldn't that just collapse the entire country as well? Thank you. And I would have loved to know how Mugabe missed the ball and letting very powerful people to actually get to a point of tanks in Harare. He must have missed the ball somewhere. But maybe you don't need to answer that one. But I would have been intrigued to, inside the corridors of power on how he, he, he missed that one. Thank you. Yes, I, I missed uh, slightly the first part of your question, but I think he, you are basically uh, asking uh, whether I see Armageddon. Yes, I see Armageddon. The, the pressures, the inflationary pressures are too much. And this government, this regime, is not powerful enough to attend to the genuine structural reforms that are actually needed to confront uh, the huge humongous problems and we are too close to an election we've got less than uh, 10 months to the next election we are too close to the election to the window uh, of genuine uh, reform 
So I see them digging the hole deeper and because of over-reliance on monetary policy, over-reliance on, 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 on printing money. So you're going to see in this year record amounts of money being put to uh, command agriculture. You are going to see this year record amounts of money being to put to either road rehabilitation or infrastructure and so forth. All those things will fuel inflation. They are going to be paying these contractors. They are going to be paying farmers. They are going to pay all the cartels in Zim dollars. Uh, so broad money will increase uh, seriously and exponentially. But that broad money, that Zimbabwe dollar in a hyperinflationary environment you have to find a safe haven and safe haven is the US dollar safe haven is is is, is a commodities safe haven is real estate Safe haven is, is the Zimbabwe Stock Exchange. So the Zimbabwe Stock Exchange is going to grow exponentially uh, irrespective of the economic fundamentals. The cost of houses in Zimbabwe are going to grow, uh, is going to increase and increase exponential and those who are listening to me please don't sell your house now wait for six months it is going to pets uh, it was it was the, the, the problem the issue around the coup it was there for everyone to see the paper in 2014 and argued that there's going to be a coup in zimbabwe it's just a question of when and, and there has to be a soft landing. Just like now, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see the signs of uh, another impending uh, uh, coup. We don't want it. Uh, we're against it. So I think that... Uh, I think I, I'm quite sure that uh, President Mugabe would have uh, received intelligence report, but sometimes uh, the, 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 the sceptre of... Uh, the, the 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 authoritarianism of the incumbents you get so arrogant the arrogance of the incumbents you get so arrogant you feel you're so powerful you feel you are so untouchable you think that they can't do anything to you because you are so powerful and i think that is the mistake that uh, he made in this inner circle and made uh, they thought they were too powerful uh, to 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 collapse you asked me another important question should the government move in to let the cartels collapse and won't the cartel uh, uh, collapse the economy? They won't. The cartels won't collapse uh, the economy. So dealing with Kudata Gire will not collapse this economy. Uh, dealing with uh, with the uh, Radesh, uh, dealing with the uh, breaking up the INSCO cartel, uh, uh, you know, you know the INSCO, they're into everything. National Foods, Kolkom, uh, 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 Ivan chickens, it, it won't break up. It won't break up the 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 the, the economy. You're just basically uh, and unbundling. It should happen. It should happen. It must happen. Uh, you can't have a country where two three people control fifteen percent of the GDP. Uh, that can't happen. Even from a ZANU PF point of view, it's unwise because those two three people can actually topple a government. That's why we've got an anti-monopoly legislation called the Competition Act. And that's why in every other country in the world, they've got antitrust and anti-monopoly uh, legislation because, because uh, cartels are dangerous and cartels are political. Cartels are very political and cartels are a constant source uh, of uh, political and economic uh, stability, particularly in a poor uh, little country like, uh, like, like, like Zimbabwe because their presence becomes a disproportionate uh, because they've got so much money. Insco doesn't know what to do with their money. I was being told last week that they've just bought Edgars. So they're now into everything, everything, everything. That's not good. That's terrible economics. And, uh, and it shouldn't be allowed at all. 
Thank you, Tendai, for answering those questions. Um, uh, ladies and gents, we only have eight minutes left uh, to try and respect Tendai's time as well. I will take the last three questions um, all together and hopefully he can answer all three of them together. So I will start with Stanley, then Kuda and uh, Dr. Jeddah. So Stanley, if you can unmute and ask your question and Kuda the same and then Jeddah. Stanley? Hello. Yes, please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. PGD. Okay, uh, mine is not really a question, but uh, I just want to say I agree in all material respects with uh, what Mr. BT has been saying. But my question to Mr. BT will probably is um, uh, what would you prefer, dollarization or joining the RAND union? Uh, personally, I think there are more merits to be, to be enjoyed by joining the RAND union, such as the accessibility of the currents, and it makes our exports more competitive. Well, what's your take on that? Thank you for your question, Stanley. Um, Kuda, over to you. Okay, um, am I audible? Absolutely, yeah. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. I'll try to make my question very quick. Um, Honorable Beat, if you allow me to quickly take you to the future, 2023, let's, let's assume that the CCC wins the elections and you are appointed the Minister of Finance, would you, uh, as a measure of trying to fix the financial system, be open to the legalization of cryptocurrency? Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be legal tender in the country, but to allow people to buy, sell, and hold cryptocurrency, as we're seeing, as happening in the Central African Republic, uh, and as well as the Ecuador. And I ask this because you are sort of the economic czar for the CCC and as well as the influence of the IMF and the World Bank and other Bretton Woods institutions, which aren't really big fans of cryptocurrency. So Africa is the largest and biggest growing market for cryptocurrency. You've got Nigerian youth who are changing their lives through it, Kenya, ETC. And Web3 can help create jobs online for professionals and non-professionals. So this is why I ask. Thank you. Thank you, Kuda. Uh, Tindai, I hope you've got that question. Oh. Um, I've got it, sir. Hopefully, it's the last one. Uh, what, <laughs> yeah, the last question coming, and then that's uh, doors closed. Dr. Jeddah, if you can unmute and then. Dr. Jeddah, going once. Going twice. <laughs> okay, Tendai, it's over to you. Apologies for that. No, no, thank you. That's there. Thank you. Well, look, I think the we can't run away from the U.S. dollar at the moment. So it's a transitional currency. But the U.S. dollar can't be a long-term currency for Zimbabwe because it's too expensive. It makes our exports too uh, competitive. So so the future is the randomization of, of, of Zimbabwe. Uh, but with a floated Zimbabwean dollar, with a floated Zimbabwean dollar. But as I said... Sure. Instead of instead of saying uh, the RAND is the future, let's go regional integration. Let's have a monetary union in the RAND. Uh, Sorry, I can't uh, so wait that on we have one which is that by another name, just like the euro is the German Deutsche Mark by another name. So the future is regional integration in the adoption of a regional uh, currency. But in the short term, you can't do away with the, with, the, with the U.S. dollar. The U.S. dollar is so integrated in this economy. It's the, it's the currency of, of, of reference. Uh, so you, you, you can't uh, you know, avoid that. Legalization of crypto. Look, I spoke about blockchain technology before. And cryptocurrency are, are blockchain uh, technology. So no government can let let against technology. Uh, you can't you can't let it against a, a crypto a currency but but <laughs> I, I i we must also understand that uh, there's a lot of speculation around cryptocurrency i i bought some crypto and i've lost badly uh, you know uh, uh, that uh, i think it's good to ask the question that uh, that there's a serious crash on uh, on crypto uh, you know currencies but it's an, it's an individual choice people lose money uh, on the stock exchange uh, people lose money uh, in, 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 in betting clubs that are now scattered all over Zimbabwe. Uh, 
if you say Liverpool are going to win the league, you are going to lose in my brother. I'm Arsenal. I'm not a betting person, but I thought it would be number four. We're not going to be number four. So people lose money. But the bottom line is that you can't avoid the future. You have to embrace the future. And cryptocurrencies are the future. But having said that, regulation is important. Anything unregulated is dangerous uh, for people. Uh, and, and so there must be regulation, but people must make it individual choices. If you want to buy the crypto, it's your constitutional uh, right. If you want to invest on the cons on the stock exchange, it's your constitutional right. And on the stock exchange, you're going to make, make a choice. Do you buy Delta shares? Do you buy Econet shares? Uh, do you buy old mutual shares? That's choice. That's, 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 that's democracy. So... Without a doubt, uh, cryptocurrencies yes, have to be impressed, uh, but there must be regulation uh, uh, and also there must be edu education so that everyone knows that uh, uh, there are also dangers uh, attended. Is we are in fact experiencing at the present moment. Thank you very much, uh, Tendai. Um, Zala? I was for so that we can release him. Thank you so much, Honorable BT, for sparing your time to join us tonight. We have stretched for three hours, uh, but this space is recorded. You can still listen to it and engage and we continue with the conversations. Mapoko? Yes, uh, thank you, Tendai. Thank you so much for being patient with us and riding this whole journey with us. Um, guys, this is Uncensored. It's hosted by Umzala Tom. I thank the audience for also lending us their ears. Um, the only thing I will say is I apologize that we couldn't take all the requests and we couldn't take all the questions, but uh, we do have a hashtag, uh, Tendai. So if you still want to continue the engagement at some point, maybe tomorrow or the next few days, please pick up on those questions and um, give the audience uh, the, the answers that they, they, they would like. Um, once again, thank you so much, Tendai. Guys, this is recorded. Thank you. Thank please you. engage with it again. And hopefully we can have you again as our guest um in the future uh to talk about 2023 maybe um mzala i have nothing else that i can add i'm humbled to have heard him speak to us today and speak so candidly uh if you want to say anything else after that have a good night everyone thank you so much honorable beat Thank you, thank you.